let's say you report something. There's almost a supposition on the on the part of the person who's hearing that report that, oh, well, he wants to believe that. Does that enter into it where there is this confirmation bias? Or is it like, hell no, I was like, this could kill, this could blow up my plane or this could be an enemy of the United States and I'm a patriot and I signed up to defend my country. At what level do you react negatively? And someone says, oh, of course, he just wants to believe in these things in science fiction. And they're like, we all do. But he's using, you know, the fact that he's seen things or, or witnessed things, you know, to bolster that. How do you guard against that? Because that, that's a common claim that people make, right? No, I mean, no, frankly, I haven't heard that people claim that. Um, but uh, if, if they are, um, so be it. But, um, you know, for me, I, I try to keep myself on the, the line of what I've observed and what I've directly talked to my colleagues and what they've seen. At the end of the day, I'm just doing my best to report on that and to improve the, the aerospace safety around it, right? And so yeah. that's where my, all my effort is. So if people want to look at my track record to justify my behavior, then they're going to see nothing but me focusing on aviation safety on this topic. Yeah. Because for me, that's the most pragmatic way that I can reach back and you know be able to help the people that I used to fly with. Mm -hmm. Whenever I engage in this topic, I do so two ways. One, I try to engage with stakeholders within government, within DOD, be able to provide answers to the most pressing questions they have, right? Because again, I'm trying to support national security here and aviation safety, and that's the best way to do it by directly interfacing and solving the problem that they have. But we're also engaging the conversation uh, on the civil side as well. Uh, one of the uh, activities that we're planning at the AIAA is actually a uh, small sensor package that can be distributed uh, to schools and the general public. And we're looking to tie that in with a uh, data provider and service provider uh, that would look to uh, donate that uh, compute time to be able to run algorithms that we're generating at the AIAA to provide that wider plethora of data. It's about trying to find patterns in that data. So the more that we have, the more we can kind of suss out uh, some of those details. And that's a similar, I think, process that can be done um, with eyewitness reports and non-sensor reports. I think the, the bar is higher. We need more data so that we could pull out uh, those trends. Uh, but I think there is valid information to be pulled out of there en masse, right, on average, as we look at the data. I was talking recently with a, with a colleague, I won't mention who he is, but he was in the military intelligence field. And he was talking about, you know, the the preponderance of events of anomalies that seem to occur near military traffic. Area 51 is a huge, you know, Groom Lake, Edwards Air Force Base. I was talking recently with a with a colleague, I won't mention who he is, but he was in the military intelligence field. And he was talking about, you know, the the preponderance of events of anomalies that seem to occur near military traffic. Area 51 is a huge, you know, Groom Lake, Edwards Air Force Base. Is there anything, you know, to be said about that? Like from the perspective of aviation safety, at least, like just avoid those areas? Or could it be, as some suggest, you know, people are either the, there's technology from an adversary would like to go to those areas too and get a sneak peek at an F-18, right? Um, or an F-35. So what do you make of that? Is there anything, you know, to this theory that, uh, of course, things are going to happen in strange ways, you know, call me when it happens over Times Square kind of reaction that I often get? Well, my first go-to here is that there's probably observation bias involved. So we're seeing them there because we have uh, the sensors to actually be able to see. Now, with that, I also don't think, you know, this issue is going to be one particular thing. Uh, but Sam, for a while, and, you know, we're going to find adversarial platforms. We're going to find drones and things of that nature. We're going to find trash. That's great, and that's helpful to our national security, and we have systems in place to uh, mitigate that. But there's a category that, you know, we're ignoring essentially that that data set, and that's that's what I find we need to work down. So you know, I think we're going to have adversarial platforms around those bases. So there's going to probably be uptick in you know unexplained or, or um, unidentified uh, objects around those bases, maybe just because they're adversarial platforms. But I think there's an observation bias as well. And to your point earlier, you know, you're talking about kind of the Bayesian probability of of you know a commercial pilot versus military pilot seeing these and what, what that can affect. It's such a small bubble that a commercial pilot can see. So, you know, when you're talking about sightings from fighter jets, you know, you have the potential to get highly correlated data across multiple sensors, you know, different types, as well as, you know, different geographical locations of the data reception, if you will, or the sourcing. Ground-based sensors or eyewitness statements, things of that nature, you don't have that luxury necessarily. And so we would expect to have much better data around those systems. What, what kind of supplementary information data, et cetera, quality, quantity, calibration, would you would be most beneficial to you and your mission? So I, uh, I'm not going to answer it the way you want, but we can go into some of that more stuff after. But to start, I would say, sadly, uh, it's not a technological problem. It's a stigma problem. Yeah. Uh, and so 
if I was, you know, in that position, I would be pushing in the middle management ranks in order to standardize reporting on this across all the services. I think there's buy-in at the top, there's buy-in from operators, but there's, you know, essentially middle rank officers that are, you know, at that operational level that uh, either are going to make or break that system. And if they don't have buy-in on it, there's also ways that you can uh, implement that into training, into the actual aviation uh, training pipeline, things of that nature. Um, so stigma reduction of that will increase pilot reporting uh, to enable new data uh, that will allow this conversation to be a normal scientific endeavor. You know, in our capitalistic market, we can have you know an industry around this. We can uh, advance sensors. We can potentially get government funding for uh, these different companies to be able to expand and provide solutions to the government. So reducing stigma, I think, just allows this whole conversation to open up. Mm-hmm.